Morning, Hilltop. Ooh, response. I'm so honored to be with you. I, before we do anything, I think it's wise to talk about expectations. Many congregations believe a myth that the district superintendent has this gigantic well of pastors that he can just dip into. They can't wait to come here. Uh, the well isn't deep. The truth is God's got to move. I've done four interims, and they've all gone over a year. I just finished uh, Adrian, and that was 15 months. Sometimes congregations feel like, is this an interim? It's going to be about three months or so. Think in terms of, of, of upwards of a year. The process is slow. It's prayerfully deliberate. So I just want us to enter into realistic expectations. So with that expectation, where should I start? We're going to be together for a long time, and I can't wait to get to know you better. But where should I, where do you kick off? Kind of push the boat off ashore. Well, it's maybe something really deep theologically. No, how about encouragement? Let's kick off with just a, a note of encouragement. And I, I want to also set the stage and let you know something very important. I'm great. <laughs> well, laugh if you want. I, I'm not good. I'm great. You're saying, oh my, the arrogance of this guy, I can't believe it. Let, 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 let me back away and explain to you how I discovered I'm great. I, I have an, I, I, it's, it's a gift to my wife, an annual blood work, and I'm terrified. Not of the needle of the blood, that doesn't bother me. I'm terrified of the results because I'm a sugar addict. My doctor goes to my church, he can't figure out how in the world I'm not diabetic because I know sooner or later the party's over. Sooner or later, I'm going to come back a diabetic and, and I, no more sugar. And I know, I know some of you are diabetics and, and you have full lives. I, I get that. You're wrong. A good breakfast to me, a cup of cinnamon rolls and a Coke. A better breakfast is more cinnamon rolls and two Cokes. I put sugar in my body at levels that's just inappropriate. Uh, Dr. Don's, my doctor, said, you know, Gene, maybe you should add fruit so now I'm on Pop-Tarts. There's fruit in there. Don't be a judger. So I, I, I get my, my blood work every year, and I'm always afraid sooner or later the party's over. And to this day, I'm not diabetic. How God is blessing me. So he, he does the, the, the blood work for everything. And, and the lab order, I can't understand. It's, it's, all, it's all alphabet. Check is A, B, C. Check is C, D, E. It, 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 it's all these numbers, letters and stuff. I don't know. So every year he calls me. He's, he's my friend. He goes to my church. He says, I got your, I got your blood work. I say, how's, how's the sugar? He says, you're still good. God's on his throne. About a, a dozen years ago, he said, your, your ABC is a little high. And, and I said, okay. He said, that, that's your cholesterol. Not a big deal. I, I, I prescribed a stepstatin or something like that. I got a whole year's worth. We're, we're going to monitor it. So now he calls me, I say, how's my sugar? You're good. How's my cholesterol? He always says, the, the, the medicine we, we've prescribed, perfect. You're right back where he wants you to be. I've given a prescription for a whole another year. So tradition, my blood work, about nine years ago, same phone call, Don calls and says, God's on his throne, it's a miracle. You're not diabetic. I, how, how's the cholesterol? Looks good. So I, I'm hanging up. You know, he goes, oh, uh, your PSA spiked. More letters. I don't know. So I'm thinking, okay, my body's changing. I'm getting older. Uh, another pill. So I said, another pill? He said, no, no. A PSA is indicative of prostate cancer. Cancer? Other people get cancer. And he said, I've, I've arranged for a, a urologist. They're, they're going to biopsy it just to confirm it, but the, the spike is pretty, pretty substantial. Now, our, our hospital in Valparaiso is a nice community hospital. If you need a cast or a broken arm, fine. But I'm one hour from Northwestern in Chicago. I said, cancel. If I got cancer, I'm going to Northwestern. So I went on in, and, and they, they kind of laid it out. They said, you know, your number for your, your prostate's about a three. I can't wait for you to go home. They say, what he preached about his prostate. Anyway, ADD, just hang on. You're a 10. You go up one number, we care. To go from a three to ten, that's pretty substantial. So he begins to explain to me all the ways that they deal. You, you, you can put, seed it, you can, you can remove it, all, all the procedures. I'm thinking, this guy knows I got cancer. 
He said, well, biopsy it to confirm it. Well, I don't like that. Sounds like I got cancer. We'll biopsy it, we'll confirm it. But the problem, Northwestern's so busy, I had 10 weeks waiting for that, that confirmation. Well, one thing about me that's not, not, a, not a, a plus, I'm hypochondriac. As I get older, I get worse. I go see someone in the hospital with, in their arm, I walk out, my arm's bothering me. I'm, I'm terrible. So now I got cancer. It hasn't been confirmed, but a hypochondriac, I'm going to bed thinking about cancer. I'm waking up thinking about cancer. And I did the worst thing you could do. I went online. So I, all of a sudden I'm learning about prostate cancer. If you're a man and you have it, compared to all the cancers, it's not a bad one. Only about 3% die. But a hypochondriac, I'm part of the 3%. I'm on my deathbed. Then it said, it can spread without symptoms. No symptoms. I'm filled with cancer. I mean, I, I was terrified. For 10 weeks, and for 10 weeks, I didn't tell anybody. I thought, when I have the surgery to save my life, I'll, I'll, I'll tell the church. But I want to tell them now. So for 10 weeks, I fooled them. Nobody knew. I handled a wedding. I, I, I like to play with, with, when you get to know me, I, I like to tease and play. I was playing with people at the door. Nobody knew I was dying inside. It's, it's like I could put this mask on and completely fool everybody. Now, the, uh, the test did come back. It was a false positive. I'm fine to the stake. Praise God. But the issue is those 10 weeks. I fooled everybody that I was terrified. I could go to church, I could put this mask on, and nobody knew. And that, that's the day I discovered, I'm great. I can fool you. Here's my fear. I think you could, you could fool me. I think you could be dying inside. I think you could be terribly hurting, and not a soul knows. Because you're great. You can put this mask on, go to church, shake hands, love on everybody, it makes me wonder, who's here pretending that everything's fine when down deep inside the fact is it's not? And God calls the church to be this unique community of believers where we actually take the mask off and we break through the walls. Maybe the depth of our community is equal to the depth of our vulnerability. So the question I want to ask, can I take off the mask? Because I've been fooling people about how much I'm hurting. And this is hard. We want to be the rescuer, not the rescuee. But vulnerability is contagious. Can, can Hilltop actually be a safe place? Because that's God's design for the community. Safe to be vulnerable. Because Satan attacks us at vulnerability. He attacks us at our self-image. For the sake of community, can I be vulnerable? Father, this morning, someone's walked in with a mask. And already they've identified and say, I do that. I pretend everything's fine and I'm hurting today. Father, may this be a day where finally the mask begins to kindly come down and we actually let somebody into our vulnerability. The story of Sherlock Holmes and Watson, Sherlock Holmes, that, that, that fictional great, great sleuth, Watson's his assistant. Every time he goes into a, to a crime scene, he says, Watson, tell me what you see. Watson tells him all the clues. Every time Sherlock Holmes goes, let me point out everything you missed. So their friendships get a little rocky. And Sherlock Holmes realizes, I've, I've been hurting my friend. So he goes to Watson, I tell you what, let's go camping, couple of guys. Let's just go take a tent, go out all night, just us. And let's kind of reconnect. Watson's thrilled. Three in the morning, dead of the night, Sherlock Holmes wakes up Watson and says, look up, tell me what you see. Watson can't believe the guy's testing me. We're out here to stop testing me. What Sherlock Holmes doesn't know, Watson is an expert in astronomy. So Watson gets his revenge. He says, up there I see a thousand stars, but they're actually balls of gas. And they're twinkling because they're coming through our, our hemisphere. He lays out all the chemicals of the hemisphere. He said, beyond that, they're the, they're the, they're the planets. He, he explains every planet. Beyond there, there is, there's dark matter and, and reverse matter. And he goes 20 minutes covering everything in the sky you could possibly think of. And then when he realizes, I've left nothing for Sherlock Holmes. He says, now, Mr. Holmes, you look up. Tell me what you see. 
Sherlock Holmes said, Mr. Watson, someone stole our tent. <laughs> we'll do that. Sometimes we'll go into this deep, deep theology way out there, and we need to, and miss what's right in front of our face. We're talking about deep, deep stuff, and the fact of the matter is, people are dying. They're hurting. They're discouraged. They're defeated. Coming in with a smiley mask. Satan says, how can I damage the community? How can I damage Hilltop? How can I defeat you? There's a wonderful passage in the Old Testament, the very end of the Old Testament. What are the last prophecies about Jesus? Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. Take a look at it. But for you who honor me, that's the church, goodness will shine like the sun with healing in his wings. The issue, healing in his wings. Odd. But that's slang. We need to almost go back in their time. You ever notice every time Jesus went to a town, they called him teacher? Fair question. How do they know he's a teacher? Before he teaches anything, they welcome him and call him teacher. How do they know? Back then, the high priest would have a uniform, a garb he would wear. A high priest came into town, you knew it. He wore the clothes of a high priest. The different roles, teachers had a, had a garb. Jesus wore the garb, the uniform, or you want. Jesus wore what the teachers wore, reserved for teachers to wear. So when he walked into town, they, they would call him teacher. Well, they knew. Now, the teaching garb was kind of weird. It had long tassels, and it would drag on the ground with long tassels. When the wind would blow, and they would hold their hands out, those tassels would fly. And so the, the slang of the day, they'd call them the teacher's wings. So when it says, there's healing in his wings, I'm actually talking about his tassels. That even in the tassels, there is healing. So let's, let's fast forward to Jesus. He's walking in a crowd. He's being jostled. I mean, everybody's reaching out, touching him. And while he's being jostled in this crowd, a woman reaches out and touches a tassel. And she's healed. The prophecy, healing in his wings. Jesus stops, dead right there. Something happened. There's been a healing. He turns to his followers. His disciples said, somebody touched me. The disciples are going, Jesus, come on. Everybody's touching you. And you ask, which one? I, I, I want you to see this passage. Mark, beginning with the 24th verse. Take a look. A large crowd followed Jesus and pushed very close to him. Among them was a woman who had been bleeding for 20 years. I mean, yikes. She'd suffered very much from many doctors, spent all the money she had, but instead of improving, she was getting worse. Should have went to Northwestern. When the woman heard about Jesus, she came behind him and touched the hem of his coat, the tassel. She thought, if I just touch the hem of his clothing, I'll be healed. Instantly, the bleeding stopped, and she felt her body was healed from the disease. At once, Jesus felt power go from him. He turned to the crowd and said, who touched me? That's a dumb question in a way, isn't it? The follower said, look how many people are pushing against you. You ask, who touched me? But Jesus continued looking around to see who touched him. The woman, knowing she was healed, she came and fell at his feet. This unique episode, touching the tassel, being healed, exactly fulfills the prophecy, there's healing in his wings. In fact, we actually use that slang in our Christmas carols. You, you ever notice the third verse of Hark the Herald Angels Sing? Hail the heavenly Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings with healing in his wings. Okay, time out. We may be together close to a year. Here's, here's my love gift to you. I will never sing again. <laughs> hey. Healing in his wings, that interesting thought, isn't it? Maybe what we need more than anything is to reach the tassel. There's healing in his wings. Some are mostly damaged. I think people get damaged by other people. Somewhere, somewhere, someone's told you what you did wrong. Where you let someone down. Where you failed. Satan's dominant attack at the church is our self-image. Because he will damage us, we're not effective. Failure is an event, not a person. We end up with our great fear being fail. We live our life in regret. And so we won't try anything because we're, we're guaranteed we're going to fail. Now, first of all, Jesus loves you 
not based on how you perform. He delights in you. But a damaged self-image, Satan can push that button. Anytime you begin to grow, Satan can push that button and remind you, you're a failure. Because the Bible calls Satan a lot of words, evil and everything. A lot of words for Satan. You know one word that's never used in the Bible for Satan? Stupid. He not one time called stupid. His wisdom's perverse, but he knows how to work. And he works on the church. It's an epidemic in our churches. We don't feel good about ourselves. We don't feel confident about our church. I can't becomes the cry of the defeated. No, no wonder Proverbs 18, 14. Take a look. The will to live can get you through a sickness, but no one can live with a broken spirit. No wonder Satan wants to attack you at your spirit. Satan is so effective. The cry of that can't is I won't. No matter where Christ leads. I mean, doesn't this go back to Moses? Is this the most interesting conversation in the Bible? Moses talking to God through the burning bush. And God tells Moses, this is what I'm going to do through you. The whole time Moses is telling him why he can't. I don't care why Moses can't. I don't care about Moses' gift. God says, I'm going to use you and I'm going to do this. Drop the mic. My favorite verse in the entire Bible. Moses literally says, hear my Lord. Send Aaron. Frankly, who cares what Moses' ability is? If God says, I'm going to use you and do this, that's it. Your talent is not the issue. God will accomplish what he intends to accomplish through you if we let him. We're the ones messing this thing up. As I said, there's an epidemic in our churches. Hurting, putting a mask on every Sunday. And we're good at it. Hiding our vulnerability. Satan reminds you what you can't do. Reminds you it's not going to happen at Hilltop. He loves this evil campaign. He'll damage you today. Now, I'm going to jump around a little bit, but I promise I'll bring it all together. My son teaches a military survival. He is a, in, in, in military. He's been uh, three terms in Afghanistan, one in Iraq, and the whole deal. But he teaches military survival in the Arctic. Navy SEALs have to get, go there, uh, Army Rangers, and he, he's on the team that teaches. And he lives in Fairbanks, Alaska. I told you that to say, therefore, we go to Fairbanks every year. Grandkids. Where there are grandkids, I will be. So I told you that to say, we go to Alaska every year. I get Alaska. I understand Alaska. Because I've been there upwards of 20 times. And it's a different culture. I said, well, Gene... We, America, America's strength is how diverse we are. I mean, the culture around Harvard is probably different than Mississippi. Not better, but certainly different. I get that. In the lower 48, where we're a mismatch of cultures, it's our strength. Alaska is a different beast altogether. And those up there, things that are Alaskan, unique to them, is holy to them. I mean, it's sacred to them. And there's nothing more Alaskan than the Iditarod race. It's the greatest race on earth, the most the most grueling race on earth. And you say, yeah, I, I know it's, it's this dog, dog sled deal, isn't it? Yeah. But in order to get the story, I need to give you a two-second tutorial on how this thing goes. It honors a diphtheria outbreak in Nome, way up there. A dog sled team miraculously got, miraculously got the antidote there. So they honor this every year. The Iditarod distance is 1,161 miles. 1,161 miles. I wanted a reference, so I Googled Chicago to Denver. That's 1,080. So Chicago to Denver, tack on 80 more miles. It's insane. It's run the beginning of March, and in Alaska, life stops. It's a race of intelligence. It's a race of endurance. Only about half the teams even finish. And it's interesting. The lead dog is the champion. And there are farms all over Alaska training these dogs. They get a special diet. They're very expensive to keep. It reminds me a lot of horse racing. If you've ever been to Kentucky and those tremendous farms, Alaska, there are the dog farms for the Iditarod. It, the, in horse racing, the winner of the race is not the jockey. It's the horse. I, I could care less about horse racing. I don't know anything about it. But I've heard of Secretariat. Who rode Secretariat if my life depended on it? There's no way I come up with that. During the Depression, there was a horse named Seabiscuit. The horse won the race. Who rode Seabiscuit? I got nothing. 
In the Iditarod, it's not the, per the human being on the sled, it's the lead dog. That's the champion. And if you've ever seen the Kentucky Derby, the, the winning horse has ring of roses around his neck. The photos of the, champ of, of, of the lead dog that won the whole thing, roses around his neck. And this corporate betting, billions with a B, is bet over the Iditarod. Because they, they don't run 1,161 miles. They run for an hour, and they're checked. And they run for another hour, and they're checked. They go, they go, they go stop to stop to stop to stop because of how dangerous it is. And veterinarians can pull dogs at any time. No team finishes with the whole team intact. So they run point to point to point. Should you get there an hour before me, you leave an hour before me to take off for the next round. The betting isn't merely who's going to win. The, they have identifiers that track this stuff. It's amazing to me. They will bet who will get to each, each checkpoint. This is a fast starter, but they fold toward the end. They will bet what teams won't make it all the way. Half the teams don't make it all the way. They will bet everything you could humanly possibly think of. Because when they get to this point, if there's a dog that can't continue, they pull it. But the lead dog cannot get pulled. He must do the whole thing. He is prized. There are identifiers that write every year because they study these teams. And the lead dog is a golden. The race takes about 10 to 12 days. There are 16 dogs plus a lead dog, eight teams of two, and a lead dog. They average about 30 to 35 miles an hour. Now, in March, the Arctic temperatures tend to be about negative 50. But running 30 miles an hour, you ever be in a car and put your window out, your head out a window? For the rider, it averages about 100 degrees below zero. The rider has special masks because you can't breathe that in. It'll damage your lungs. Dogs have food on their paws all the time. The vet has the last word, but that lead dog, he's got to do it all. And there are farms. Tammy and I got to visit those farms. It's phenomenal. Once they begin to train the dogs, they want to find out who's fast, who can fly. It's like a football training camp with stopwatches. They'll show treats 10 yards away, turn them loose, puppies. Then 20 yards away, then 100 yards away. Who gets here first? By the time they're adults, they know who's going to win. They have apparatuses just to have them pull. Who loves pooling stuff? And when you go in the summer, you can get a ride. They're almost like a wagon with wheels, and they'll hook up a, a team, and they'll say, you, you can pay for it, of course, but you can get a ride through the woods. It is really fun. So my first time, I'm in there, and, 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 and the trainer's going, you may want to hold on tight, sir. And I'm thinking... It's going to take a while to get up to speed. I, he gave the signal. I about fell out. He looked at me and he's going, tourist. I mean, when he says go, bang, they're off. And you better hang on tight. I mean, the power of these things. And then when you're done, he says, go down and thank the dogs. Because those dogs have to be used to strangers. They're going to be checked every hour by a veterinarian. So you go down and pet the dogs and thank them. And when you're holding these dogs, they're different than dogs. They're muscles with eyeballs. I mean, they are just beasts of strength. It's the most demanding race on earth. They don't talk about 2009 with all of the precautions. Six dogs died on the run. With that as a background of the Iditarod, how it operates, going back to the 1980s, the breeder, five puppies, which is a big brood for that, that type of dog. The fifth puppy is a runt. He's terrible. He's slow. Every rate, everything they do to test this dog, he fails. They say, okay, let's run. The dog will, will lay back and say, you know, you pet my tummy. I believe I'm okay right here. It is amazing. Every intelligence test, every test of strength, everything that's designed to evaluate these dogs, he's, he's the worst they've ever had. In fact, they tell the owner, this is the single worst dog we've ever had. They go by the number. After a short time, they're, they're given a name. Now, the name can, can represent wh what they do. If this is a dog that always wins the race, they may call him Rocket. If it's a dog that loves to pull stuff, well, they may call him Zeus, strength. So the owner is with, with the trainer saying, okay, the fifth dog, number five, what should we name it? One, one trainer said, how about dumb as a bag of rocks? How about useless? And the owner wasn't here for these trials, and he's, he's kind of ticked off because they love the dogs. He said, what are you doing? And they said, sir, this is the slowest dog we've ever had. This is the dumbest dog we've ever had. This is the worst dog in our history we've ever had. 
And the trainers went out. So now we have a dog by the name of Granite. Susan Butcher, a, a, a young girl, one of the trainers said, I tell you what, I'll work with Granite. Or in my spare time, I'll try to see how, how we, we can get something out of them. Because not all dogs end up being Iditarod dogs. They sell them. If they fail, they don't kill them, but they sell them. They make great pets. You can be on a waiting list for them. There comes a time when we cut bait. Who do we keep? Who do we sell? And maybe, maybe, in this group, there's a lead dog. That's uh, it's gold. Is there a dog that excels in everything? Up is food, up is challenge. So the evaluation time comes. And the owners are saying, let's walk through the dogs. He gets to granite, and all of them say, sell them. He goes to Susan Butcher. Susan, you have given your time to granite. Tell me what you think. And Susan says, I love this dog. He's going to make a great pet. He's not a dinner rod dog. So you, you can't just put granite in a box and send him to Susie in Alabama. A veterinarian's got to sign off. Granite goes to the veterinarian to be signed off. Veterinarian does not come back with granite, but paperwork. He says, I'm putting granite down. He's got a disease. It's one in a million. His, his siblings don't have it. He's got a disease that's going to kill him. Maybe that's why he failed in everything. And the death is a horrific death. He won't survive. Here's the paperwork. Let's put granite down. His chances of surviving are so small. Susan Butcher, he might survive. Give him a chance. Susan says, I'll get him through this. An argument happens, and the owner finally acquiesces and says, Susan, here's the deal. I'll let you try. But we're going to monitor this thing. Number one, if it gets too bad, we're stopping it. But number two, he's gone. He's a pet. Susan realizes this is the best chance I'm going to get. Maybe he'll survive. The whole time the vet's going, no way. In her book, Granite and Me, she lays out what happened. Granite obviously survived. And she told him, you know, we named this dog Granite as a joke. It's perfect. There's never been a dog this strong. Now, Susan, a woman in 1984, qualifies to run the Iditarod. That's, that's a shock. A woman on the 1,100-some miles in the Arctic. And the rider gets to choose their team. The, 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 the school, the training center, put a team together on her behalf. They said, Susan, here's your team. Susan said, that's fine. I want Granite as my lead dog. They all say, no way, no way, no way. And an argument ensues. Susan's battling. She wants Granite. She's, I can communicate with Granite. Granite knows me. And, and they said, yeah, but Granite is not a, a dinner rod dog, let alone a, lead, let alone a lead dog. He will fail. And the owner says, Susan, Susan, we make our living on our sponsors. Our sponsors expect our teams, if not finished, come close. Granite's going to get pulled on day one. And we're going to have 16 dogs, partner dogs, ready to go, and our lead dog gone. We're going to be the butt of jokes. You cannot have this dog as a lead dog. Granite won out. You're saying, well, this is great. Granite did really well, didn't he? Well, there were no votes. There were no betting allowed. No bet was allowed. No bet was allowed to even that this dog would finish. Because it's so ridiculous. It'd be as if University of Michigan football team's playing a high school team. You're not going to bet on that game. This is ridiculous. Most of the bets, he'll be pulled on day one. Gene, he did really well, didn't he? No, he failed. Granite got pulled on day one. They knew he was going to fail, and he failed. Not his fault. Not his fault. There was a bull moose attack. Moose. People say bears are an issue in Alaska. No, moose are an issue, issue in Alaska. They're territorial, they're aggressive, and they're mean. One thing I learned I found interesting, how they hunt moose. They'll take a moose antler and scratch it on a tree. A moose in the area will hear that other moose in the area had come to kill it. They're aggressive and they're mean. On the trail on day one, and there's only a few hours of daylight, as dusk is coming, a moose attacks. It's savage. She's on the radio yelling, Mayday, a moose attack. They come out in snowmobiles as fast as they can, but 20 minutes go by before they can get to the point where Susan is. And the moose has a free reign on these dogs. I mean, they're all, they're all ch chained in on, on, on their leashes. And I'll, I'll skip, but it's a horrific parts of dog, blood on the snow. Picture it how you want. The moose is so out of control, they had to shoot the moose, and they put the dogs on sleds and try to get them back. Some of them are, are declared dead right there. Susan's in shock. She's had a front row seat to this massacre. She's back at the checkpoint having some soup. 
And the veterinarians come and say, okay, here's the situation. The dogs are going to survive, but they'll never be a dead or odd dogs. Who knows what's in their head? But that one dog you all call Granite, we're going to put him down. The damage is too intense. Susan says, no way. What this dog's already lived through, he's called Granite because of a name. He, get him there. He, he will survive. She wins again. He's taken to an Anchorage veterinarian hospital, and Granite survives. The next year, 1985, Susan says, I'm running again, and Granite's my lead dog. And I think, well, everything we said that was wrong is still wrong, but now it's worse. We don't know what's in his head. He's going to hear a sound up there and kind of freak out on you and take off and, and disobey. It's, a, it's noisy up there. Those, those, those glaciers move and creak. He might think it's another attack and bolt on you. Everything that was wrong is still wrong, but now we got to add, we don't know what's in this dog's head. 1985, granted to the starting line. Susan won again. The bets, none. No chance of finishing. Pulled early. There were even bets that the dog would disobey and have to be pulled off the race. Gene, what happened? He disobeyed. He got pulled. They reached this point, and Susan gives the signal to go this way, and Granite went that way. And Susan's getting ready to get on the microphone and say, Mayday, the dog has disobeyed. Because I can tell you right now, I've been in those sleds. No human being can turn. All those, all those partner dogs are trained. Follow the lead dog. That lead dog goes the wrong way. You cannot stop them. Their power is, is overwhelming. There's no way she can turn them once that dog makes up his mind to go the wrong way. So she gets on the microphone and she's ready to yell, Mayday, the dog has disobeyed. Come and get me. Because night's coming. It's life and death. And she wrote something in her gut, her soul, said, trust granite. And she put the microphone, the, the, the walkie-talkie down, and said, take us. And I'm thinking, I'm going 30 miles an hour, the wrong way, 100 degrees below zero. What would I do? Mayday! Mayday, the dogs go nuts! I'm screaming. Yeah, you look at me, you would do the same thing. Granite does this bizarre circle right to the checkpoint. Now he's hours, hours behind everybody, and they're terrified, worried about him. They came in and they said, Susan, what happened? And she said, well, I don't know. The dog veered off, and I, I felt like I, I would trust him, and he got us here in this weird circle. And they said, well, what did you do? What did you do about the soft shelf? Okay, time out. Soft shelf. Those glaciers are mountains up there, and they move. Sometimes tons and tons of snow can come flying down. And you, have, you may have a mile or two miles of the brand new snow that's deep, but it is so soft it's quicksand. And if that's in the track of the Iditarod race, it just kills, it just kills the race. Because those dogs can't get through there. They yell soft shelf, they come out in snowmobiles, but they can't take the snowmobile in the soft shelf. They gotta drag the dogs out. By the time they get to the checkpoint, some of those dogs are so exhausted in, in the quicksand of snow that half the teams are pulled. It wrecks the idea to ride the whole, it, it's a mess. So they said, how did you get to the soft shelf? Susan said, we were on hard ice all the way. They get a map out. At the point the soft shelf began is exactly where Granite veered off and took him around the soft shelf. I did a files talk about 1985 all the time. Susan wrote, that, that was the day I knew Granite was special. So identophiles are talking about 1985. They're trying to sort out two questions. How did the dog know where the checkpoint was? How did he know there was danger? The checkpoint answer, they say, we think it's his nose. They have an incredible sense of smell. He might have just tracked his nose right where the food was. Okay. You know, I don't know. The second question, how did Granite know there was danger right ahead? Their answer is priceless. We don't know. But he did. And in 1985, a dog they named Granite finished the Iditarod. He didn't win, but that's not the issue. A dog that was branded guaranteed failure in 1985 led a woman on top of everything else to the finish. The point, never live down to someone's expectations. No one has the right to define you what you cannot do. 
No one can brand you. No one can discourage you. No one can attack this church saying what we cannot do. Satan cannot win at this point because it's an epidemic. I will not have a God vision ruined because I'm guaranteed I can't do it. It reminds me, Philippians 4.13, isn't this not one of your favorite verses? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things. Hilltop can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In 1985, a dog named Granite finished the race. So Gene, I think I'm with you, but it's a little convoluted. You're saying I should feel better about my church and, and better about myself because a dog finished I did a rod? Well, yeah. It's kind of a metaphor, isn't it? No one, nothing in this case, but no one was more guaranteed to fail. They named him Granite as a joke Worst dog we ever had, slowest dog we ever had, dumbest dog we ever had, should have been put to death twice. Once as a puppy, once with the moose attack, leading a woman through the world's most grueling race, defined never be a lead dog, never be a partner dog, no bets were even allowed. Was anything ever more guaranteed to fail? And in 1985, Granite finished the Iditarod. 1986, Granite won the Iditarod. 1987, Granite won the Iditarod. 1988, Granite won the Iditarod. The first three-time grand champion in the history of the, of the world's most grueling race. In fact, the dog they named Granite, this guaranteed loser, is the greatest dog in the history of the world's most grueling race. You're saying, Gene, there you go. You know you preachers. You do that. That's a nice story, but you make it better. You tack on a little something. He's the best dog ever, 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 ever. But not, I'm not exaggerating this time. The Iditarod Museum is in Warsaw, Alaska. Now, it's not a granite edifice. It's what it ought to be. It's three gigantic log cabins. And as you go to the entrance to those log cabins, there's a, there's a statue. And it's a lead dog. And underneath it, it merely says, in honor of all the great lead dogs of the Iditarod, and then small print, Statue is modeled after the greatest of them all, the one they named Granite. Take a look at the beginning, at the entranceway to the... In fact, there are statues to Granite all over the state. And Susan Butcher, oh my, she's our girl. I mean, this is, this is a holy event for them. And this woman, three-time grand champion, are you kidding me? Susan Butcher is our hero. There's a tiny post office in China, Alaska. And it's one of my favorite because at the front door, there's a, cut, a cardboard cutout of Susan Butcher. You have your picture taken with Susan Butcher. On the other side of the door, there's a statue. And it really says, Granite, the greatest lead dog of them all. Take a look at the, at the post office in China, Alaska. There are statues of this dog, all, particularly over the northern part of the state of Alaska. Granite, the greatest of them all. No one can define what you're not going to do if God called you to it. I could do all things. No one defines what this church cannot do if God calls us there. Every story's got an epilogue. Let's, let's wrap up the epilogue. Granite ran again in 1989. He finished, but he didn't win. So the winning streak was three in a row. You only run these dogs in their prime, obviously. So they ran them in 1990 saying this is the last run for Granite. And he went out the way a champion ought to go out. Granite won it again. A decade later, Granite has died. Susan's married with two small children. And her husband notices the drive of Susan. And Susan Butcher's got drive. She fought for Granite's life twice. The drive of Susan Butcher isn't there. He says, you know, I think it's an iron deficiency or something, but you, you know, we need a physical. Something, something just ain't connecting here. And she went. And it was leukemia. Advanced. Now, leukemia in 25 years ago was very different than today. Today, so many different options. Leukemia is not necessarily a death sentence. 25 years ago, it was terminal. Different world back then. Word got out, Susan Butcher is going to die. Alaska goes in the morning. This is our girl. We got cardboard cutouts of this girl all over the state. Susan Butcher is a fighter. She will fight, and she did. Until August 5th, 2005, Susan Butcher died. Fairbanks is overrun. This is an event. 
politicians, identifiers, fans, trainers, racers, owners, name it, vets. They're there to pay their respect. Susan Butcher, this their girl, lines around the block getting into the chapel. And once they walked in the chapel, the newspaper article said, they began to immediately weep. Part of it might be that up ahead they can see Susan's husband and two small children. And kind of an angle, they can see Susan in the casket. But the article says, no, we think it's because of a gigantic banner hanging. It's the 1987 championship banner. And in, in, those, in those banners, usually the racers in the back like this and the lead dogs sitting in the front with, with, rings, with the roses around his neck. Not this photo. Susan's beaming and she's holding a dog in her arms, holding a dog to her chest. And there's roses around the dog's neck. This photo is iconic. There are Iditarod shops in Alaska. You could buy this as a postcard. I mean, it's an iconic photo. It's Susan and Granite together again, and she's holding Granite to her chest. The greatest team of all time. I thought you'd want to see the picture of Susan Butcher and Granite, 1987 champions. As they saw the photo, there they were alive. They began to cry. March 1, 2008, Susan's honored by the state. The governor at that, side, at that time, Sarah Palin, a bill to honor and remember the life of Susan Butcher, an inspiration to Alaskans and Maine's all around the world. March 1 is now Susan Butcher Day. If you go to Alaska and you're there on March 1, and you say, I I've lost track. Is, is today March 1? They're going to say, you don't live from around here, do you? You don't go on Michigan's campus and say, you're all the Buckeyes, aren't you? You're going to say, you don't live around here, do you, my friend? March 1 is Susan Butcher Day. End of story. But there's a quote in the newspaper article when she died. I think I told you the whole story just for this quote. Let me read it to you, an editorial. Without Susan Butcher, there certainly would have never been a granite. And of course, they knew the story. Should have been killed as a puppy, the Musatek. Without Susan Butcher, there would have been a granite. But also, could it be, without granite, there wouldn't have been and butcher? Without granite, would she be just another racer? But together, they were the perfect team. Incredible. They found the line marked impossible and crashed through it. Come on. They found the line marked impossible and crashed through it. They found the line marked impossible and crashed through it. Partnering with Christ, I can find the line marked impossible and crash through it. What is impossible for you? What has been impossible for years? What do you put a mask on the church to hide the fact that you're bleeding? Did I tell you there's healing in his wings? Decades of hurt, there's healing in his wings. I've been branded a loser, there's healing in his wings. I've been defeated. There's healing in his wings. I'm discouraged. There's healing in his wings. I've been ambushed. There's healing in his wings. I have failed. There's healing in his wings. I'm embarrassed. There's healing in his wings. I've been beaten down. There's healing in his wings. I have sinned. There's healing in his wings. For you, for crying out loud, take off the mask and let us in because you're great at faking it. Mark chapter 5 tells us about a woman who grasped at the wing. You know, Satan may not need to, may not need to defeat you, just, just distract you. Take your eyes off Jesus. Take your eyes off the tassel, the one with the healing power. The better you think of yourself as a child of God, the better your goals become. The better we think of ourselves as a body of Christ, the better our goals become. No wonder Satan wants to attack us at our self-image. We're the church. Gates of hell back up. We're on the offense, not the defense. No one ever won a war and retreat. No one can define you in the negative. No one can define Hilltop Nazarene Church in the negative. The Lamb is alive and we are victorious. This is not just a place for singing and teaching. It's power. I can do all things in Christ. The line marked impossible and crashed through it. Let's stand together in a prayer with you.
Father, we're not here for a pep rally. We, we don't need that. But maybe what we need is to be encouraged and be reminded who we are in Christ. Because Satan has a way of changing this, moving the goalposts on us. Who we are in Christ with the ability to do anything you call us to because it's through you, not me. There may be someone here that's saying, man, I'm glad I came today. I am defeated. I am frustrated. I am hurt. I am bleeding. And nobody knows because I'm really good at not letting them in. I could pretend everything's really good. I've done it for so long, I've gotten great at it. Father, Maybe someone that just needs to reach out and say, God in heaven, I need you. I need you for my wound. I need you for my hurt. I need you for where I bleed. Is that tassel for me? In my own heart, I just want to reach out and touch you and say, God in heaven, I need you. I am your servant. And I want to go forward with you. I want to be victorious with you. Because I don't need a pep rally, I need you. And we come to you in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Something that I've always done, kind of want to begin a tradition before we leave. Just tell you what we're going to teach next week. The Greek original term for this, commercial. Biblical term. Uh, there are seven churches in Revelation. What people don't understand sometimes is there's a story. You can't change the order because this church creates this church, creates this church, creates this church. The order is everything. And, and I, I want to walk you through, and you're saying, you know, Gene, there wasn't a whole lot of theology today. And I love theology. Next week's your week, my friend. Next week's for you. Because we're going to break them down theologically. Once we understand what's going on with those churches, we realize, whoa, there's a whole story here. And in some ways, it's a story of victory. In some ways, it's a story to guard against defeat. And so next week, I want to walk you through those seven churches in the book of Revelation and unveil the story for you. And maybe you know someone that says they would be very interested in that. Well, that's why I tell you what we're going to do. That's now your opportunity to say, you may want to come next Sunday. We're going to, we're going to walk through something that I think would be very fascinating. Thank you for worshiping with us. I can't wait to get to know you better. May God bless you. Go in peace of Christ and encouragement of Christ.